Yes, totally. Um, I just pressed record, so we're officially recording. And Booker? I'm here. Carol? Here. Alex? Here. Javier? Not yet here. Am I forgetting anyone? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Um, Noah, while we begin public comment, could you see if you can contact Hildegard? Yes. And we will begin public comment. Um, please, all of you, please welcome to the Alternatives to Policing Subcommittee of the um, Northampton Public um, Commission for looking at policing or the Policing Review Commission. Um, we're going to be open for public comment. Um, each person will have three minutes and I'm setting my timers. So when we're ready to begin, we will have three minutes for each comment. Um, if you, if those who would like to make a comment want to raise their hands and I will call on you. Okay, Ya Ping, please. Hello. Hi. Oops, oh, hello. Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you all so much again for all the hours you're putting in for everyone. Um, I Today I can't stay for the whole meeting, so I'm sorry, I'm going to share a comment and then jump off. Um, I, I just wanted to share some good news or like, intro, like I think really inspiring instances of successes that sort of illustrate how this movement has been growing nonstop since the summer. Might have emailed this already, but I recently watched another webinar on Seattle and sort of some details about, um, so Seattle in, I think it was November 23rd, they actually voted on an 18% police budget cut. And like Austin, it was a combination of moving responsibilities out of the police department into another department. So they weren't getting, changing those um, responsibilities at all. They moved 911 dispatch out and also traffic enforcement and actually the traffic people that were part of the traffic, not, not um, sorry, not traffic parking. The people that are part of parking enforcement wanted to be moved out of the police department. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I forget what percentage of the 18% came from shifting responsibilities and then but there was also money that was cut, I believe, to the training budget, although I'll have to check on, yeah, I think the training budget, they um, defunded vacant positions that were just being held as vacant positions, some cuts to overtime, some cuts to training. And so that was, that comprised 8.5% of the budget cut was like not transferring, but just cutting. And then um, some really interesting, cool things I think that came out of the cut are they um, funded participatory budgeting that is being done by black led groups in Seattle. And it's like a very cool participatory project where they're involving the whole community. And 18 million, I think it was like 30 million is now going towards participatory budgeting. 18 million of that came from a task, a mayor's million task force it was called. And then 12 million came directly out of what would have otherwise gone to the police budget. So like a little less than half of that participatory budgeting um, budget came was possible because of the cut to the police budget. Um, and the, also what came out of this like budget adjustment was a lot of wins for housing and services that were considered really vital, like access around transportation and paths and also like direct services to the houseless population. Um, and another cool thing that they did um, with the new budget, like the revised budget was to fund some climate action stuff. I guess like the climate action initiatives in Seattle had been mm -hmm. proposed for a while, but an office previously hadn't had a staff member allocated. And so because of the new budget adjustment, they are able to hire a staff person that they said is really key in like moving anything forward around climate in Seattle. Um, and and also- So I'm, I'm sorry, Ya Ping, oh, your time minutes. is now up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, could you, if you could send, I don't remember seeing that document and things that you've sent. So if you could send that, that I, to us. Yes, yes, I can send you my notes on that webinar. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Um, next will be Robert Eastman. Hey, everyone. Um, so I also just wanted to share about something happening in another city in Austin. You may have heard that the city council approved to purchase a hotel for permitting support housing. 
um, and is considering buying another one next week. And they were able to do that by spending $16 million from their planning department. And uh, I think three and a half, or sorry, six and a half million dollars uh, that was cut from the police budget. So I just wanted to read you a quote from an article reporting this news. It says, in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests this summer, we made a significant cut to policing dollars and reinvested that in things like this, purchasing the hotel, said council member uh, Gregorio Kazar, <laughs> who led the effort to cut police funding and sponsored an amendment last August that set aside six and a half million in recurring funding to be used for permanent supportive housing and services. That's how we're paying for this. That's the only reason we're able to do this. And I would definitely look into, maybe I can send you some links, but he, that council member was really active in like building consensus on the council. And there are some interviews with them that talk about that process. Um, and so I'm not here to say that we should be buying a hotel, although maybe we should. I heard Pamela Schwartz the other night uh, talk about the need for just more affordable housing. Um, but some of the other things I heard at that meeting are <laughs> that the housing crisis is really dire right now, like it's an emergency, and especially because it's so cold outside right now. And so some of the things I was hearing last night, like from Pastor Steph of Cathedral on the Night is like, they need a warming center, they have a place, but what they need is a staff person to oversee it. She also said that it should be someone with experience working with this population. And Jay Levy of Elliott Homeless Services also talked about the importance of like how you approach people who are in crisis um, and the vibe you give off. And I think, you know, these are pretty good arguments for hiring peer workers. And this is something that could happen like <laughs> soon, like immediately. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it for now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Robert. Are there any other comments before we move to Hildegard? Um, I just got off the phone with Hildegard. She is going to try to sign on now. And I told her if she's not um, on in the next five minutes, I'll call her back. Okay. Um, but the planned uh, part of our agenda for this meeting was to include um, a, a comment. Um, I'm moving ahead and looking at the agenda. Uh, we were going to have, I believe it's Jennifer Tilly to talk about harm reduction strategies. I was unable to complete being in touch with her. The email address I had with her didn't work or there hasn't been a response. So with that discussion will not happen. I'm going to let you know, ah, I see that Hildegard is appearing. Um, Hildegard, you, it's now time for you to speak if you are there. Can you unmute yourself? Hildegard? Yes. Th I'm, thank you I'm, for, thank you for joining us. I'm not calling. I'm not calling as a uh, respondent to your, as a speaker to, to just give an input. I'm waiting to do my public speech. Okay? You, are, uh, you are now, we are now prepared to hear your public speech. You will have 10 minutes. That's um, fine. So please go ahead. Well, you you don't want me to do that now, though. Actually, I do want you to do it now, but we've finished oh, the public you comment. Oh, you finished the other. Right. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Noah Coffee Moy just called me. Well, I am Hildegard Friedman at G68 in Cahill Apartments, and I am about to talk about opiates and drug trafficking, which I have been around all my life. I am 
a person that is now living in poverty in government housing. And you need to know also that the senior property manager has agreed to have the residential supervisor move me to Framingham on, on Natick, and we have made out papers, but I shall stay with this committee as long as I am alive, if you have such a committee. I was born in Boston and was raised in a, a father's home office in the Winter Hill Gang area of Somerville, which was Whitey Bulger's Winter Hill Gang. And uh, I have lived with drugs around me as long as I have been alive, except for 10 years when I moved to Hardwick in approximately 2002. I left Hardwick and went there in 1996, approximately. And I was sort of in my own enlightenment then and not not anywhere near any place that dealt with drugs. I moved into a big 13-room Greek revival, and that is another whole story, which I'm not going into this at this point. Um, along the way of my life, my father was a person that dealt with Whitey Bulger Gang, and he also had Cosa Nostra, a Boston office in the Hanover Street part of the north end of Boston. That was a different mafia. And I lived there in 375 Broadway, Somerville, until I left for uh, to get married in 1961, I believe it was, or 19, excuse me, 1963. But in the year 2000, when I was 30 years old, I was born in 1940, in 1970, and my sister, who had just left for Jamaica, uh, who had a, a attorney husband who was working in my father's office regularly, um, I got a call from my sister's father-in-law telling me to tell my parents that my sister was dead and had raided on her way to Jamaica the um, opiates phenobarbital and had jumped from a high story in the Waldorf Astoria in Boston to her death and uh, he had to deal with my brother-in-law and the son of my sister. So that was quite something. And when my father died in 1990, I was had a lover psychiatrist emeritus of Tufts University School of Me Medicine, Dr. Lewis Wexstein, whose family would not object to my saying this, but you don't know that, who informed me most specifically that my father was a uh, mafia physician. And the Whitey Bulger gang was in and out of my father's office, and I have a sign in my apartment here at Cahill, which is the sign that my father put on the pavement in front of his office, no parking, Dr. Kushner, and that was where they parked at that sign. Um, my my thinking is just dispersed right now. I'll be back with you. There's a vast difference between what the policymakers think in, in books and talks about opiates and, and sex trafficking uh, and what the reality of the world of drug trafficking. And that's why I got somewhat into a panicked portrayal of the dead man here 
um, who is and was Dennis Dex, uh, Dustin Dextrace, son of Dennis Dextrace, and that was on November 21st, 2000. His death was on November 21st, 2020. I had gone to the New Northampton Police Station uh, uh, many times, but at that time, I went to get a message through to my detective about what I perceived as a cartel, and I had regularly been speaking to Dennis Dextrace, excuse me, Dustin Dextrace, and Dennis Dextrace. And opiate addictions, which you are very much cognizant of in your speaking, is are a disease, and they need to be treated as a disease. Um, and according to the National Institute of Drug Health, more than 72,000 Americans last year died from this. I'm not going into all the, all the cartels and all the cities that have opiates and, their, and portraying what is happening there because I don't think that's going to get you anywhere in what you are doing. I am not recruiting missionaries for the Bay of Pigs. I have not killed people for Jimmy Hoffa or Whitey Bulger, but all through my life, this has been very close to my life. And I read many times about the Desperados, which were a big point of contention in the last presidency and what we have in a mess over what we face now to do with these people. And I look forward to your success in this matter. And it is a world problem. And I look forward to your continuing with this excellent committee, which I hope to continue and stay on. I'm sorry that I called in late, if this is late. Okay. So thank you very much for your comment, um, Hildegard. You, um, I'm glad that we've finally gotten to hear someone who's had the kinds of experiences that you um, can remark about. And um, I'm sorry that you're moving to Framingham, um, but I'm glad that you want to stay in touch with us. Okay. I will more than stay in touch. I will be on whatever committees you are on, or I will try to be participating in whatever committees or human rights endeavors. Thank you so much for your presence in my life. Thank you. Thank you, and Godspeed. Thank you so much, Noah, and, and Javier also. Thank you. So I now want to move into the rest of our agenda. As I was beginning to say, I was unable to com uh, complete um, meeting with um, Jennifer Tilly, who is going to give us a presentation about harm reduction strategies. We'll tr I will try to arrange that for another meeting. Um, we have a couple of issues have come up that um, we need to discuss. The first issue is um, um, Alex had actually made arrangements to have Chief Casper meet with us for our planned meeting on February 9th. But Noah has reminded me, and actually when we see the future schedules, that would occur at the same time as the larger Human Rights Commission meeting. Um, so <clears throat> I guess I'd like to discuss, would it be possible to move that meeting to the following evening, which would be Wednesday, February 10th. Alex, do you have a sense of, I mean, all, all we can do is ask um, Chief Casper if that could occur or? Um, I think one of the reasons we scheduled on the 9th was because I have a conflict oh. until eight on the 10th. Now I could come at eight, um, which is when we suggested that Chief Casper come if that would be possible, or we could even say it's 8.15, if that would 
make the timing work better for you? No, I can be there at eight. I can leave the other meeting a few minutes early. So, but um, we need to know if Javier can make that time as well, because we'll need, that's what will be required because we'll need a quorum to start. Okay. Um, so do you want to, find out from Javier and then I'll check with Chief Casper. That we, I can do that. Okay. If Javier doesn't join in up for this meeting. Okay. Carol, do you have thoughts? Yes, please go ahead, Carol. Yeah, sin since we're talking, I'm, I'm fine with uh, whatever you decide on the, on the uh, 9th or 10th, I'm fine with that. Um, I just, since we're talking about scheduling, I've, I've been reaching out um, to the restorative justice people, and um, I need, I'll need to hear from this committee whether I should make a formal invitation to the Brattleboro, uh, the director of their, their RJ program then. She's happy to come. It turns out I was mentioning a uh, meeting that I have on my calendar, which may or may not be correct on the 3rd, February 3rd. Are we scheduled to meet then? She has a conflict, she can't come. So she said she's open to coming to another meeting to talk about um, the, the, just the developmental history of the Brattleboro uh, RJ program, you know, what the hurdles were and everything. It's sort of an important testimony for us. So I just need to hear from this committee when to try to reach out to her to schedule her in. So let's come back to that, Carol. I, okay. By the way, you had sent me a message informing me of that problem. Yeah. And I thought she had also suggested another person who might be able oh, to Oh, the, um, the, I think, I think I wrote to you after I talked with the program director oh, okay. Okay. Who, who had a conflict and she said, talk to the ultimate director. Okay. And, and the ultimate director has a conflict. Okay. So I'm going to, um, so there have been some documents that have been sent out from Dan and um, Cynthia who are as the co-chairs of the overall policing commission, um, they are beginning to work on how they would like to get outline materials done for so that we can move towards doing the final draft. Um, I'm going to want to screen share something. If that's okay. Noah, could you allow me to screen share? Or I think also this has actually been sent out to all of us. So I think this document that I have up on the screen now um, has been sent to all of you. This is a new document that has been put together by Cynthia and Dan for a developing a process and timeline for our report. Um, now, we're sort of in an interesting spot because all, all we have to work on is what is our final report recommendations. And, and I'd like to have a further discussion about what that might mean. Um, um, whereas you can see what the other committees have. So our timeline is really focusing on recommendations. Um, so this is one issue. And I'd like to think together with all of you about what does that mean? And what do we want that to look like? And I'll, we'll come back to that. There's another um, message that's come to Javier and I to share with you. I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, and that's, I'm going to have to read this to you, I think. So we also received an email, which I'm gonna to read to you. Um, I can then send it to you later. Um, hello, subcommittee chairs. Dan and I are beginning to compile the bones and addendum of our final report. We know several commission members and subcommittees have engaged with numerous community experts during our commission work. We would like to compile a list of those individuals with their titles and organizations we should include community activists and those who are willing to be named in our final report. Um, if we've worked with individuals who wish to remain anonymous, we wanna honor them as well and ensure our final report audience knows these voices were part of our process. 
Okay, here's the to do part of the message. We are requesting you send the names and affiliations of the individuals you spoke with or who visited your subcommittees as a guest. Also, if you can include the number of individuals who prefer to remain anonymous, that would be appreciated. This will be a running list as we know several more people will be engaging with us in the near future. We just want to get a head start on drafting the report. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, another to do list we have is really identifying the um, people who've been helping us in this effort um, and being able to name them. Um, what I didn't read you is they would like us to start compiling this list before our honor before February 19th. So they're gonna want us to submit a list that's part of that list. Any questions about that? Just a comment. Hmm. I ho certainly hope we could do that off screen and share it with our subcommittee to for completion and rather than using time on the screen. So by the way, um, Rob Eastman just sent me a comment though, uh, of asking who that was from. It was actually from um, the two co-chairs of the larger policing um, commission. Um, and it's a request to all of us um, so that we start compiling that information. And, you know, um, and quite frankly, Robert, you've been one of those people who've been helping out a lot in this process. And I think, um, we should figure out a way to get your permit. Uh, how do we obtain your permission if you would like to be named in that report or not? Um, I mean, do you have thoughts about? Uh, pardon me for asking this now, but is yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, that's something I would need to think about and probably discuss with others. <laughs> I think so. I think fine. That's exactly what I would say if I was sitting at on your Zoom screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Email is a good way to reach me, though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is essentially an acknowledgement section. Thanks for your. I think so. To the the following people. Not that it doesn't necessarily mean you agree with everything that's in the report, but it's just mm -hmm. we thank you for your contribution. Yeah, and it outlines your process too. And yeah, I understand that. Okay. Yes. Are there any other questions or comments about that? So it sounds like we should uh, ask the individuals who have who have given us information. It seems like those people might get a lot of duplicate requests for this. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, oh, I mean, would it make more sense to ask that the that everyone just send in the list? along with their contact information to the co-chairs of the full commission. And then they say, would you like, they send an email that says, would you like to be included in the acknowledgements? And if they say, if the person says yes, then that, that way, cause I could see each of us writing to, you know, Robert and Yao Ping and uh, getting that and, and then just sort of duplicating that. Yeah. So that's just a- I, I think they're, they would prefer to have this all flow through the co-chairs um, through, in the case of the alternatives uh, subcommittee that it would flow through Javier and I, okay. um, so that all of us aren't writing things. And I think what I'm really asking is informing you all of this. And also um, if you're thinking of people, uh, for instance, Alex, I know you've been talking with people outside of this, um, outside of our zoom meeting process in order to get information um and i guess the question is, is should some of those people be named and for instance carol is now talking about people she's speaking with also and whether they should also be named within this process or not okay so i'll send you a list of mm -hmm. the folks and you will ask them if they wish to be yes. included okay. if i've Great. got contact information yeah i think it's really important to get permission Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because being acknowledged in a process can be a double edged sword. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it, what you just described as, as gathering names and getting permission sounds fine. The other thing that I'm sitting here thinking about is whether 
and this would not capture everybody probably, but posting, you know, just posting a notice on, on the, the website saying, you know, if you've had a role, if you played a role or participated in any way in this policing commission, review commission, we would like to uh, acknowledge your part your crucial participation, please uh, let us know. I mean, kind of reaching out to the people themselves. I mean, that wouldn't work for for the people that we've contacted through known agencies. We need to like contact them directly. Mm -hmm. okay. But I'm, I'm wondering about posting something. Yeah. I can ask Dan and um, Cynthia. Yeah, like an invitation. Because I mean, every every good movement or you know um, for social change is 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 really the work of many people, and I don't want to forget anybody. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to a different topic now, because the police chief has said yes to coming to meet with us. One of the other things I placed on the agenda was beginning to prepare which questions we would want to ask the chief. Um, so that the chief can prepare answers as best as possible. Um, so I think I, what I'd like, will this is also on the agenda for our meeting on February 2nd. Um, so I guess I would like to start a process of what kinds of questions we would like to um, ask um, the chief. Is it okay if we begin to discuss this now? Sure, yeah, I, I have a document I can share uh, that Ooh. has my questions and then we can all uh, edit that. Is that acceptable? That would that sound be, good? that sounds wonderful, Alex, thank you. Okay, so first I'm going to share this with uh, Booker, Carol, and Noah as, as editors. And then I'm gonna share a link for comment um, in the chat for the public. So you all should have received, well, no, you'll get the link for comment, but if you're logged in, Booker and Carol, you'll be able to edit. So hang on. Okay, so do you have that? I have it. Is this up? Uh, is this up for people who are watching? Um, so yes. can they see it also? Okay, they can comment. Um, so my my rationale here is, you know, this is primarily informational for me, I want to know how things are currently done. And then I want to have an interactive process of, if, you know, obviously, we could just ask these questions in an email, but um, then I want to be able to follow up. And um, I also want, in particular, to understand what kind of pushback we might get and kind of get that in advance. Um, so for example, I, I, uh, uh, Jody Casper has said that they have watched um, Rachel Bromberg's presentation, uh, actually really appreciated it, they said. Um, and so I want to know uh, what kind of pushback though we might get on that so we can perhaps steer uh, or find, you know, be able to in advance be able to know um, how to respond to that. <clears throat> um, uh, so otherwise for me, most of it's just informational, just trying to understand uh, <clears throat> what, really understand what they're doing and in the context of when we're thinking about an alternative and to know what the state or federal restrictions would be on any alternatives that we propose. Thank you for this format, Alex. Um, does anyone have questions or comments so far about what's up on the screen? Yes, Carol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've covered the waterfront in terms of the, the topical areas on the 911 calls, mental health, DV, et cetera. We might want to put one in there more explicitly about housing, unhoused. Um, oh, yeah. You know, uh, 
but the, um, the the question about the um, the partnership with I'm curious about that too the partnership with the C4 RJ the restorative justice group you know I was spending some time on their website and um, the that organization which is based in Eastern Mass has you know lists links to all the police departments that are affiliated and there's you know a lot of photographs of Northampton PD on there and so forth. And um, somewhere along the line, I got word from some, someone here, some advocate, and I can't even remember who, I'd have to look at my notes, that you know, there might be potential to build um, through that affiliation, a more accountability for complaints towards uh, the NPD. Um, and I would wanna know about that. Instead of just asking a broad-based question, about what are they doing with this affiliation? Um, you know, since, you know, not so much our subcommittee, but other subcommittees have been concerned about the current complaint um, protocol. Like if you have a problem, if you have a complaint against a specific officer, call um, officer powers or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's an inside uh, track of filing a complaint. I think a lot of us have concerns about that. And I would want to know by by the NPD affiliating with this, you know, C4 uh, RJ, you know, what, if anything, can change about the that would in, increase accountability. So you're uh, suggest sorry, you're suggesting a restorative justice process for I don't complaints? Want, well, I think that now that's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. I mean, maybe this is a separate question then um, about whether the chief has ever considered uh, how undermining of public input and accountability, the current, my understanding of the current complaint structure is. And mm -hmm. are, there, are there thoughts or plans to change that so that there is more you know, some outside ombudsperson. I mean, which is fairly typical in organizations. Can, you know? So, Carol, you're bring, you're bringing up a really. I'm going to ask something here. Yeah. I think developing a a better or a more effective way of doing oversight and complaint oversight is outside of the scope of the alternatives to policing subcommittee. Okay, I and hear. I, and oh, I, I want to suggest that. that that belongs in policies and procedures. Right. Okay, I hear that. Um, yeah. If that's a, if are you okay with that or? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, because Alex just, you know, by by asking the question to me, like, what am I expecting of that? Uh, that that has to do with restorative justice, which is a little bit more in in our bailiwick. Yeah. I, yeah. You, you clarified. Yes. Yeah, yes. I think the boundaries of investigation here. Yeah. That, that should go back to the other subcommittee. You're right. Okay. Okay. By, by the way, I don't know if any of the other subcommittees are planning to meet with um, Chief Casper or not. Are Are you aware, Alex? Or I have not heard. I believe one other is. I forget which. Okay. It's the spending or the the policies and practices. But yeah, I would agree that that that's outside of our scope. Um, and. Yeah, I'll, we'll let, let that conversation happen uh, in a different context. Um, with regard to the restorative justice program, you know, I mean, I think all of us have have received the feedback, and I've read how like there, there's that document, um, and actually we link it's in our preliminary report about um, you know be, best practices and issues with restorative justice, and and you know the way that the um, C4RJ is doing it is is not considered the best practice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to understand that program and then so that we can, uh, I hope, give a different recommendation. Okay. You took the words out of my mouth, Alex. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For the housing question, mm -hmm. does someone want to draft a, some language about uh, how that, I mean, essentially we want to ask, you know, what is the current approach to working with houseless people? Um, 
I think that's too broad. Um, well, it's a good start. It's a good start, though. But I invite what's, you, what's, Carol, to what's go under, ahead and write away because you're yeah. An but what's writer. what's I got to go back in. Yeah, what's underneath it for you? What's what's underneath your curiosity about that? Let's see. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it seems like mo a lot of our alternatives will be our actually, you know, house people rather mm -hmm. than uh, mm -hmm. um, police them. And so I'm not entirely sure what, you know, what, what, what we're asking as far as, I mean, there's, there's some of it overlaps with if, if there's a mental health component um, but, you know, there, there still would be a crisis response team if there wasn't a police, um, <clears throat> policing team responded. So, and I'm curious, you know, I mean, they work with a variety of other, maybe it's, maybe the question is, who do you work with already? Because, you know, Elliot Homeless Services, um, uh, we heard in the meeting the other night uh, describe their approach, and um, you know that in general their approach seems positive. The the concern I would like to think to add in about their approach is, and that of ServiceNet as well, is to build in community accountability, um, so that there's there's actually you know the they're actually accountable to the the people that they're serving. Um, so the, that's, but, that, but yeah, so I'm curious, do, do they, you know, if they get a call, do they actually prefer to not to, and, and there isn't a safety issue, do they already prefer to say, hey, Elliot, homeless services, will you go talk to those people? And that's a non-police response. Um, so those are... <clears throat> So it's almost a parallel question to how, what do you do with a mental health related call? Is what do you do with a call where the primary issue is the, per, the fact that the person is homeless? Um, and who, who assists, I guess I would be curious to find out who assists the police when they are dealing with a houseless person who's having an issue. Um, who do they bring in to help them deal with the problem? They don't. <laughs> Sorry, right. thank you. You're right, Hildegard, but you're not allowed to comment. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how would you uh, craft that, that bullet point? You, you see what I put in there? Uh, how would you craft that? I guess that's, I, it seems too broad, but I actually, I can't figure out how to tighten up the, you know, we might want to think about these and come back to them next week um, mm -hmm. and sharpen things a bit, but. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's good um, we did, we, Jody Casper is expecting to receive our list of questions after this meeting. Oh, oh okay. okay. All right. Okay. Let's, I'm sure let's... we can send updates. Yeah, okay. let's tighten it up. So what do we want to know about? Um, well, let's, well, since this is a broad stroke, let's leave it a little broad and we can tighten the questions a little bit at the next meeting. I think it's, um, okay, let's add how many, um, what percentage of police, let, I want to find out how many calls do they get with regards to mm -hmm. issues that are related to houseless people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly certain how to say that, but mm -hmm. in the same way that we have one in five calls as a mental health component, what are the percentage of calls do you get are related to? How extensive are the? Yeah. Oh, and who do the calls come from? Are they uh -huh. from the public or are they called from um, property owners? Because um, there is, when you re when I read the policing literature, um, it's frequently people 
the public calling and saying, this is, a, I'm uncomfortable, come take care of this, um, which is a little different than the owner of a business who's concerned about what's happening. Um, they might be the same thing, but it's a little different. So I'm curious as who, how many of the, where are the calls coming from? Whoops. I don't know how to use this, obviously. Sorry. It's funny how it's it's putting in them all in as suggestions oh. rather than you allowing you to just change it. But I'll just accept all the suggestions as okay. when you're done. <laughs> and it should okay. Yeah, how do you do that? Back. How do you do that? Uh, yeah, just oh. get down, get down. Um, so I just incorporated Ed Olmsted's suggestion into the um, second question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, I'm looking at the domestic violence question. Mm -hmm. I, I, what I'm trying to think of is how to ask, how do you determine, uh, this is getting into how do we judge whether something went well or not? I guess what I'm curious about is, do they have a review process for what happens with domestic violence calls? In other words, do they, how do they determine if it was a successful intervention or not, and what that might mean. I mean, this is getting into how many people are arrested, how many people are referred to services, how many people are um, taken to emergency rooms. Um, Booker, do you want to add some suggested language? That's a really good question. When you say outcome, what are you what are you referring to? Um,
Is that too vague? Well. Uh, See, I don't know what the right, uh, I, I have, I'm colored by own, my, my, when I'm talking with my own patients mm -hmm. who are in these circumstances, mm -hmm. um, I feel good if they contact a lawyer and get services. Mm -hmm. um, they don't necessarily feel, so that's my positive outcome but I'm not sure that that's a positive outcome for them. And that's why I'm having a little problem with how to frame this. But what I do wanna know is, do they feel better that the police were involved or not? That's probably oh, what I really wanna get question. at. That's the question, yeah. okay. Yeah because, yeah, because I don't know that, yeah, the safety ultimately. I'm a little uncomfortable asking for such a qualitative question yeah. from yeah. the police chief um, right. when I'd rather be asking it of the people. Right. Uh, yeah. But whether there is a feedback system um, seems important. Well, also we could ask if they're involving other agencies and helping them, is there a feedback system from the other agencies to them about whether, whether things work well or not? Are the handoffs good whether The or police not? involvement was actually added to the uh, it was beneficial. Yeah. I guess one piece of data I do know is how many, how often are they called because there is actual violence involved so that it requires a police presence? Yeah, okay. that, that's actually an important question if we could word it correctly because, uh, yeah, I mean, I think our assumption is that it is certainly not necessary 100% of the time to, to make a protocol, to make a protocol that involves a police officer every single time there's a DV call. Um, how do they discern? Yeah. How do, how do they discern when, when, uh, when a police officer should accompany, you know, it's usually two police that go out together, right? As a, as yeah. a part. Yeah. How do they discern from the from the call that they get, the nine one one call, um, that a police officer's presence would be beneficial to that dispatch. I guess a question we can ask is: Are there ever, are there dispatch calls for domestic violence that do not require police presence? Mm -hmm. And then, how is that discerned? Yeah. I guess, that, by the way, this is getting, and I think you began to bring it up, whether our current dispatch can differentiate things or not. Yeah. That's a whole nother question. Is, um, Alex, do you think it's proper to ask Chief Casper that question, or is that a question for another place? It would be interesting to talk with someone at dispatch, but I, I'm sure Chief Casper is well aware of all the processes of dispatch. Yeah. So I think it's appropriate. Because mm -hmm. I actually think that's gonna turn out to be a major yes. part yeah. of our yeah. interventions are gonna be, what do we need to do to the dis dispatch system? Right. And yeah. whether it's a standard 911 or whether there's an alternative line that people would call if a neighbor is hearing something. So we, but um, we were going to change that last sentence about the feedback. Yeah. To like describe the- Let's talk feedback about feedback system. from um, other agencies. I'm having a hard time thinking about, it's almost easier to sit and talk and say, you know, we're trying to figure out what, how to think, 
when do you feel good about an intervention and when do you feel like I feel terrible about what just happened? Well, your previous sentence gets at that a little bit. How do you determine if the yeah. police intervention was a success? You know, what are the markers? You know, what are the markers but, of a successful but I, intervention? But I, Alex, I agree, we shouldn't be asking the police mm -hmm. whether this worked well for the client that they're intervening with. Uh, we'd rather hear about that from the client. Mm -hmm. Well, probably not client because the client implies that yeah. the services of it, the services are being <laughs> provided. Uh, from the victim, yeah. I I think it's unlikely that the police department is getting feedback from survivors. But they, I would hope that they're getting feedback from safe passages if they're well, involved in a joint response. I would hope so too. So what? how do we ask that? Uh, that's actually what I'm yeah, trying to... Yeah. Well, one question is, is how often, according to their website, it's around 10 to 20% of the calls, I think, are partnered with Safe Passage. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would be useful to find out how often they're partnered for domestic violence related calls. <laughs> Do you, receive, do you receive regular feedback from allied agencies uh, or, in, or agencies involved? How about who do you partner? What agencies do you partner with? Uh, and is there feed and the feedback about? Is there routine feedback? Um, Provided. About process of. Mm -hmm. It's it's really hard for me to think of, figure out how to frame partnerships with the police. It's just sort of it. Uh, yeah. It, it's a. Well, because you're you're dealing with a structure that is. If not para, if not military, at least paramilitary. You know, it's it's hard hard to think about how you would collaborate with a system that runs, uh, you know, that way. Yeah. But it's, it, it, but it's crucial though. It's crucial. It's crucial, and that's, I think that's why we were, that's why we're here. <laughs> well, so I, I uh, uh, by the way, I mean, the parts that I listened to from Wednesday night's meeting actually described a lot of positive, uh, some positive policing partnerships in terms of what was happening with people. And, um, and I guess it's sort of, so it is possible that that can occur. Um, the question is just how do you frame that and how do you think about it? And, and putting that within, there's also a lot of places where the presence is not a positive and sort of how do we get at that? But I, I, th I guess I really want care to find out from Chief Casper is how often are they being partnered and how do they use other agencies and things to meet the needs of the people that they're trying to improve safety around? Mm -hmm. I mean, from a policing perspective, our, we have a progressive department and, yeah. and partnering is, is a, a, a key part of that. Um, and I think that, you know, they do well within this paradigm. Um, and, but, you know, we, we want to recommend shifting that paradigm. Yeah. Considerably. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but, but, but we have to recognize where it, where it's at now. Okay. Uh, and will continue to be for some time, I imagine. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to do something a, period, even if we're very successful. Um, I want to, I'm going to ask that we um, hold this discussion for 10 or 15 minutes. 
but I wanna ask something else. So we don't have to take this down off the screen, but I'm, I'm gonna ask a different question. Um, Alex, thank you for sharing with us the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the alternative media website that you sent around that um, also reports on media and stuff going on. It, um, Good stream. Thank you. Um, Carol, I don't know if you got to read that re that report or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did. did. I found it, sh it sharpened me up a little bit about where we are with our early report and where we need to be for our next report. Mm -hmm. And I read that saying, okay, for the final report, we're going to have to be quite specific and targeted about what we want to recommend. Yes. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts, assuming you agree with that. I want to hear your thoughts about, can we be targeted and focused about lots of things or should we be targeted and focused on just a few things? And so, and here, I'm, I'm just going to say out loud what I mean by that. We can be very focused around mental health response. We can be very focused around domestic violence response. We can be very focused around housing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a harder time around restorative justice. I'm gonna have a harder time around um, um, harm, re harm reduction substance abuse projects. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I wanna ask is, should we hold all of those things in or should we focus a bit? And in other words, reduce the number of things we're trying to work on. That, and I'm saying this now because this might affect what we choose to speak with Chief Casper about. Now, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Are there thoughts about that? Yes, Alex. Um, yeah, I think it would be, I, you know, I imagine, and I actually started doing this in terms of thinking about phases, in terms mm -hmm. of years, mm -hmm. um, similar to, um, I think the Brattleboro report uh, Correct. Is yeah. in that way. And so I think, you know, if we, um, my, my, my sense is, you know, a, an alternative mental health um, response, peer, peer led response, uh, putting saying let's do that let's have the, the let's that let's have this be a priority for the next year um <clears throat> because i mean that's one in five calls that's tremendous and um <clears throat> so that's that's a significant significant reduction there and um <clears throat> that's something that based on the the information that we have about like the programs say in Olympia, Washington can be done in the budget that, that we had, um, uh, you know, that we had removed from the police. So, so yeah, it's kind of identifying those areas where we say year, this is year one. Um, here are our suggestions and, and kind of going into is probably more detail about that. Um, and then uh, for subsequent phases, um, kind of, you know, kind of making an out more of an outline, perhaps with appendices, um, like a lot of like what I wrote about domestic violence, kind of could almost be an appendix, because uh, it's just so goes into a lot of, of detail that uh, we're not kind of, I don't feel ready to say, and this is what should absolutely happen, you know, at this point. Um, but it's, these are the considerations. And, you know, part of the recommendation of phase one is that there's funding to continue the, in, the investigation of recommendations so that, you know, phase two or whatever is, is, is ready to, to, you know, to move. Um, so that's kind of how, you know, if we can identify those, those areas uh, and um, see if it's kind of, it, it, these the areas that our current mayor will be at, we're asking him to implement them uh, while the next phases will be implemented by someone else. 
Carol, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I do. I'm just listening with to Alex and, and writing um, at the same time. So, yeah, I mean, you raise a really interesting question in terms of how are we going to ultimately sit down and write write our piece of the of the final recommendations. I see um, DV calls, mental health calls, and cause calls relative to house people. Um, areas that we need to, when we make recommendations for change, we need to be fairly specific about those policies and procedures because, yeah, uh, but when it comes to restorative justice and harm reduction, though I personally want to put on the table the desire in the report, the desirability of moving in these directions, uh, you know, expansion of harm reduction philosophy, the reality is these are philosophic frameworks that are highly valuable and have been adopted in some areas of the country or other countries, but they tend to run against, the, it's not resolved philosophically, they tend to run against the more retributive ideas about justice, like somebody's got to pay or or, you know, in the case of restorative justice, somebody's got to pay. I mean, there's, I don't agree with this, but there's still a lot of prevalent thinking out there about somebody's got to pay. So we've got to do more work on that area to get to the point where we can each even talk about policy and practice changes. The other, the harm reduction, we already have in this town some, some development of the philosophy of harm reduction, it was a long, painful process. I remember when I taught at Smith back in the 1990s, inviting, um, oh, what's the agency in Springfield? Uh, a Rise for Social Justice to my class. And, you know, to talk about harm reduction, you know, needle exchange and stuff. And a lot of my students at the time were like, oh no, you're enabling, you're enabling. Right, so we've seen since the 1990s, we've seen, especially with the opiate addiction affecting so many white people, we've seen uh, an openness to harm reduction philosophies applied in a variety of ways. And I would like to see it applied more in housing policy. But I think, the, I think we need to, in the final report, this, we need to mention and elaborate on re, uh, restorative justice philosophy, philosophic frameworks and harm reduction frameworks. But I don't think we need to, to answer your question, <laughs> it's been a long-winded comment, Booker. You know, we don't need to elaborate what little get in the weeds about the changes that need to happen because we need to do as a city, we, and as citizens, we need to do a lot of work to bring more people on board with that and get some money. Uh, so I would think that the specificity, which is important, in this final report, ought to relate to the DB, the MH, and the you know the unhoused issues, where we we've learned a lot by looking at other models, by hearing from people locally, and I think we're in a better position to, you know, really do bullet points about changes that need to happen, like ASAP. <laughs> so that those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, um, Alex. Do you have more thoughts after hearing what Carol just said? No. Uh, so, uh, so here's the real, uh, th this is just for two minutes now. So what I'm really asking is, are some of the, do, some, do we stop talking about some of these things uh, so that we can focus more on being more specific for the things that we really wanna highlight? I mean, I'm taken Alex by your approach of viewing this as a phased thing. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to understand, what I don't know is, do you just say, do, do you do like what Seattle, what um, Austin does? Let's just buy these hotels and deal with housing and look at what's gonna happen to the police department. Or do you say what's, uh, you know, well, let's just put in a Kahoot system and all of our focus is on that um, and some other, th that's what I'm trying to decide because it also has to do with how we will spend our time for our next few meetings. And well, what should we talk about with Jody Casper? And yeah, I mean, as David Hoost likes to keep pointing out, what's the low hanging fruit? Uh, and so though that we should definitely say, do this in this, mm -hmm. do that low hanging fruit in this coming year. And I don't know actually that 
um, a whole department of <laughs> with a mental health crisis response is low hanging fruit, but it's one <laughs> that just seems so uh, that there's so much evidence and there's so many examples that it's mm -hmm. something that that we can really you know that that there's a really strong argument for moving forward on it. I mean, housing first is another where there's a lot of evidence. There are examples, mm -hmm. but it's the funding and the the way to do it. Um, we might not get as much in terms. We might not be able to do that much um, with the amount of funds that you know we hope that we get. I'm, I'm you know I'm hopeful that say a million dollars could be put toward these alternatives. Um, but I don't know really what the mayor is going to do. Last night there was a budget presentation, and if you all want to look uh, on the mayor's website um, uh, under budgets, you can find it, the PowerPoint for it, or you can watch it on YouTube. And it, it goes into you know the financial situation that the city is in, um, and it's not dire because um, <clears throat> we have a lot of reserves. And where um, where we do see a, some significant drops, but in in income, but we're able to make those up. Um, but I'm not. There won't be a lot of push for expansion. Uh, so you know, if we can, it. But so I'm not sure if the mayor's going to say, "Well, that that police money, it's gone. We're we're not even going to do anything." and we're not going to cut more like i don't know where he where he's at and we're just going to have to see i'm i'm hoping to have a meeting with him in the next couple months to really kind of get a sense of where he's coming from um anyway that was with, a bit no thank no thank you and so we'll go back now to let's finish doing the questions for what we want to ask chief casper I, I actually wanted to do that discussion because I'm trying to feel out where we are as a group mm -hmm. about where we, how we want to do this. Mm -hmm. And this will no doubt be a discussion that we'll have again on February 2nd. And this is sort of preparing for, I think, what the discussion may be when we come back to the bigger policing commission meeting. But so that we get um, stuff done in chart in terms of, so can I suggest that we not ask questions about restorative justice programs is what we're gonna do with Chief Casper based on the discussion we just had. Or do that you still be, want to understand that, that? That's fine with me. That's fine with me. What do you think, Alex? Um, I think we should think about it in terms of priority. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. Probably, you know, we're gonna have an hour. This, mm -hmm. I'm sure she could talk for way more than an hour about all of this. So, mm -hmm. um, we'll we'll just see where we get to okay and kind of and say well clearly we think mental health component is um unhoused and domestic violence are our bigger pri priorities um then we'll we'll try that we'll ask those questions so restorative justice is at the bottom and um, yeah and that's fine um i, I guess do you want to get to the staffing levels and the rationale yeah and the laws around it, because I want to know, um, you know, kind of, as we're thinking about more cuts, uh, what, what are the limits of those with, without a, a, some alternative response? Uh, mm -hmm. And I, so, I just want to have more perspective on that. So I do want that question to be asked. Um, so this is a little bit like the question about Does that actually belong in one of the other subcommittees as an issue? Um, arguing that it doesn't because, well. I, I, by the way, I know that this is a really important issue to you, Alex, and it sort of sits at the base of, because salaries are 80 to 90% of budgets frequently. So, so understanding the minimum number of people is like a huge deal. I, I get that. Um, and we can go ahead. I'm just, I just have to ask because to me, that's a little bit of like policies and other things. Right. Um, 
it's but the information I'm trying to glean is specifically around uh, thinking about how alternative levels of staffing. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, and why? Why? Why are those levels? Set? Why and how are those levels set? And okay. what alternatives? essentially could reduce those levels okay um because yeah i won't go no the, i i get that and if so if there was a major alter someone wrote a really good article of saying if you cut the number of fires in a city by half you can't you still can't decrease the number of firemen um because you still have to have a basic availability that's there so i, I get that that's a concern where it's hard to compare with large cities. Yeah. Because you have this, you know, small geographic area with a lot of officers and you can cut a lot and still have a, a similar response time. Um, while here, when I, I just think it's a different, once you get down to this like sort of minimum number of people and minimum number that's required, you can bring in out other uh, people from outside, but, and, and I just want, I, so I, I want to know like what the pushback will be Okay. around that. Okay. You win. You've pushed me back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the only thing I see missing in the questions is understanding how dispatch works. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm think, trying to think of how to frame a, a, the question. Um, and maybe that's a question just to ask at the beginning is, just explain explain the system. I'll move that question into the list. Oh. I'm not sure that explain the current system. I think that's. I I think it, it uh, inform what. Yeah, no, what I, I wanna, what I wanna ask is if we are thinking of alternative ways of dealing with mental health calls, how will, how will the dispatch system need to change? That's the actual question I wanna ask. Um, uh -huh. But I'm not sure that that's framed in a way. I think we that, might get, might get answers to that in the, like hearing the response to Rachel Bromberg's. Yeah, 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 exactly. Cause she spoke, Rachel spoke a lot about that. Actually, perhaps the question should be Rachel Bromberg described changes that needed to occur in their dispatch system. Um, ugh, that's, I don't really wanna ask the chief, how should we change things? All right. Um, well, we can ask follow-up questions as well. Mm. If we're not, you know, if we don't get that. Yeah. That answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there, it's, um, 
by my clock, we have six to seven minutes to go. Are there other things that you want to place? Alex, do you think you have enough here to share with the chief? Oh yeah, I mean this is <laughs> this is a tremendous amount, and I'll be clear that you know we're not expecting her to have uh, detailed written answers to this, mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. just to give the the, the scope mm -hmm. of the the questions. Okay. For so it sounds like for I'm sorry. Wait. I'm, so it, no, it's okay, Alex. What I was so yeah. So what I need to do is get in touch with Javier and see if we can move the meeting. I'm going to talk with him about moving the the planned meeting for what would have been the ninth to the tenth, and that it would be um, it would be a seven thirty till nine p.m. meeting with hopefully the chief beginning at eight p.m. Yeah. When um, would you like that meeting to end, quote unquote, technically? I would like, I want to say nine, but we could, I don't, Alex, what do you think? Should we extend it to nine? I, I would prefer to say till nine, though, um, should we say it will go until 9.30? I, what do you think, Alex? Um, I'm asking for your experience of listening to these kinds of discussions um one hour hour and a half we'll use up whatever time we have mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure if i already mentioned the time frame uh, let, let's um let, let me offer my own compromise. Let's say that we will end the meeting at 9.15. Alex, do you sure. think, and, and Carol too, but I'm really, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really, I'm so glad you're on this subcommittee, Alex, and um, for a variety of reasons. So should we have time after meeting with the police chief to talk amongst ourselves as part of this meeting. Uh, to, debrief, yeah. to debrief, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I would say yes. We're gonna take in a lot of information mm. and I think it'll be formative of what we wanna come together as a group and recommend. Um, Alex? Sure. Um, so maybe we should say nine to nine thirty is that time that we'll wrap up with the chief around nine. I mean, there's nothing to prevent the chief from staying, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if she wants to stay, of course, um, the chief is welcome to stay. But we should be able to debrief and talk about what we've heard and um, and think about how that might influence where we go next. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so it sounds like the meeting is going to go till nine thirty. Um, with the plan that the, the meeting with the chief from eight until nine, um, and then a time for debrief afterwards. Okay. And 7.30 and, to eight would be public comment. Seven to 7.30? Yeah. Uh, pardon me. 7.30 till eight is 7.30 till eight. Right. So right. it's, uh, the meeting is 7.30 to 9.30. Okay. Now, um, I have proposed an agenda for the meeting for February 2nd. Um, oh, not, not the third, not the third. Pardon. I'm sorry. Oh, the, it's probably the third because the full it's, Tuesday, it's the Tuesday. So full, co full commission is Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, our next, I have the third from 7.30 to 9. Yes, mm -hmm. right. It's February 3rd. Sorry. Um, what would I've per, part of, I said part of that agenda would be refining questions for the chief. We perhaps won't need to do that. There is a possibility of doing a um, session about restorative justice during that session. Um, 
I have to say we've not done a real meeting about domestic violence response. We've been reading about it. We've been thinking about it. Mm -hmm. We've not actually done a focused meeting on that topic. Um, and there's a part of me that wants, <laughs> there's more than a part of me. There's a large part of me with, that would like to have that be a focus. What would you think about that? I mean, I keep doing the agenda saying that all of these topics are there, um, but I'd like to be a bit more focused about speakers and things like that. And yeah, on uh, I know in, in our um, report, preliminary report under further work, we list some like safe passage, for example. Mm. Uh, and um, Elisa Klein is another name that, uh, mm -hmm. People have been trying to, to, to get. Um, so uh, that sounds great. Okay. I'll make that the focus of that meeting, though all of these other topics can continue. Are there other questions or comments before we end? Um, and also work, um, work, plot, work process. I have that. Mm -hmm. There will be time as well for that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I urge everybody to keep thinking a lot about how we think we're going We already have all of our topics. It's more of how are we going to pitch them into the final report, I mm -hmm. think is what we're going to do. I'm sorry, Carol, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, I just, I just wanted to clarify because I'm, uh, the uh, Brattleboro folks uh, are happy to come and visit with us if we, if we generated a date that they can make. So shall I just go on hold with that for now? Tell them we'll get back to them. That's, that's what I think we should do. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of our just planning for our schedule going forward, are we going to try to meet every week for an hour and a half? I think that's a good idea. Should we plan for a meeting after the week that we meet with um, Chief Casper? We don't have a meeting scheduled after that yet. Yeah, I mean, Wednesday evenings are, are good for me in general. Yeah, so that would be the 17th. And again, do um, 7.30 till nine, mm -hmm. pardon me. 7.30, was it 7 till 8.30 we were doing or 7.30 till 9? I'm trying to remember. 7.30 to 9, yeah. Either works for me. Let's propose that the, there will also be a meeting on February 17th from 7.30 mm -hmm. to 9, agenda to be named. Mm -hmm. um, can I do so? We should be ending. I actually see that Cynthia is here. Um, Cynthia, <laughs> welcome. Um, we spent, before I saw your name appear, I spent some time informing the committee of the information that you and um, Dan have been sending out. Um, do you have any quick comments for us in terms of work process? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. This has been really fascinating. Um, we're actually, are you referring to the uh, timeline sheet? Yes. Yeah, um, we're gonna talk about that at the meeting, but um, basically, you know, it's kind of a, um, I hate to call it a top-down move, but just sort of saying that we think uh, in response to feedback from a lot of commission members who are pretty much fried after <laughs> two hours that we wanted to try to focus on meeting every week um, really at a point of, I, I don't think we're heading in the home stretch, but maybe we're turning the corner to focus on um, the final report. And so that's, if you see the sort of agenda there, it's very loosely put together. Um, we plugged in a couple of public hearing meetings. Um, don't know if they're at the right time, days or not. We can always move that around, but um, we wanted to just tighten, tighten it up a little bit and give the subcommittees um, the ability to schedule around a weekly meeting. And then basically what's going to happen, I mean, anything can happen, but we're hoping to begin to move in that direction, just like you have uh, today in the final report and have subcommittees, make sure we're not flopping over one another um, and duplication of efforts and where we're going toward the um, 
making the recommendations, just as you talked about here. So that's sort of the general feeling about it. The, the one thing that we're, we're concerned about, but we felt we had to do, and that was to um, reduce public comment time from 30 minutes to 15, mm -hmm. just because we feel, you know, we've, and some, and some nights we're, we're not even getting to the 15 minutes, but we've had a, a core group of people that have been amazing. Um, we want to maybe honor those who maybe have not spoken before, but we just wanted to be a little more aggressive about timing, if, if that makes sense. So uh, making sure we stick to the time, like all the subcommittees have been doing, folks did so nicely today. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Any initial reaction to that or? I'm sorry, just a quick note. Uh, Noah asked for Booker to look at the, um, his message. Uh, Noah had to hop off at 1.30. Okay, thank you. I didn't see okay. that. Any other questions? Thank you, Cynthia. Um, yeah, no worries, thank you. And, um, and uh, by the way, and I shared with the committee the, um, suggestions around naming more of the, our sources um, and coming up with the process that we make that part of the report. Thank you. We, we want to really, um, we're thinking about the, the actual bones of it and then putting the meat on the bones. But one of the things we really want to do is the, the commission has done so much, con so many contacts with organizations and people. And we want to honor that in our report um, as, as we move it forward. So thank you for taking the time to, to give us that list. Sure thing. Um, I'm now ready to hear a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Uh, second. All of those, if, please <laughs> raise your hand if you agree with adjourning the meeting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Booker, one follow-up question. So I'm gonna, before, I'm gonna wait to hear from you. I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna write to Javier in the next, three minutes okay, um, to try to clarify, because that's a major, we really need to give the chief adequate time to think about things, so. Okay. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.